Everyone, thank you very much for joining us today for this webinar on learning from rapid data to inform policy on COVID-19 in Zambia and Malawi. I'm very excited to um, welcome our expert panelists today. On the panel, we have uh, Dr. Andrew Silomesi, Director of Public Health and Research from the Ministry of Health, Zambia. We have Ms. Besnat Simchembu Kangalu, Principal Planner at the Ministry of General Education, Zambia. We have Dr. Elliot Collins, the Principal Investigator for the Recover, as well as the Director of Poverty Measurement at IPA. We also have Mr. Witness Alfonso, Senior Associate Researcher at the Institute of Public Opinion and Research, Malawi. And finally, we have uh, Mr. Salifu Amadu, our country representative at the IPA Zambia office. I will be your moderator today. My name is Tamara Bilima. I'm the policy manager at the IPA Zambia office. Thank you so much to our panelists for being here. To our attendees, please make use of the Q&A platform to send any questions you may have for our panelists. Before we go into the presentation, allow me to zoom out very briefly to explain a bit the vision for this kind of work that IPA has and our approach to ensuring rigorous evaluation is used to improve lives. As everyone here is aware, extreme poverty is an agent problem. We also know that the global community recognizes this and spends billions of dollars each year on development assistance. However, most of this spending is based on the best guess of the people managing the money, rather than on rigorous evidence of what actually works. So simply put, IPA exists to help solve this problem. We do rigorous research to figure out what actually works, and we work to make sure that the evidence is used to improve the way and aid money is spent. Developing rigorous evidence on different strategies to fight poverty creates an opportunity to make a positive impact. Not only does research contribute to public knowledge, but what we learn can be leveraged to change the way that uh, money is spent at scale for the better. IPA is a pioneer in figuring out how to solve this enduring problem. We do research to figure out what actually works, and we work to make sure that the evidence is used to improve the way aid money is spent. We combine the mindset of a venture capitalist and that of a scientist to pair the willingness to innovate with a rigorous methodology to identify impacts. Earlier this year, as you may have very likely heard, three researchers whose work was foundational to our approach won the Nobel Prize in economics. So while IPA is known for our cities, We've learned over the years that just conducting our cities is usually not enough for evidence to actually be used to improve lives. Our work now really has three pillars. We co-create research together with the decision makers and practitioners who need to buy in for evidence to have impact. We also share the evidence strategically to the right people at the right time, both at the global level like we are doing today, but especially at the local level and with partners. And thirdly, we also work to equip decision makers to use evidence to improve their lives. Thank you so much again for joining this webinar. I will now turn over the mic to Elliot to take us through the overview of the recover. Elliot, over to you. Thank you so much. So as you said, we're working here to produce descriptive research that helps us understand uh, the situation as the COVID-19 crisis continues uh, in order to uh, ensure that policymakers are able to make good decisions and that researchers are able to ask the right questions. Uh, so the, the Recover project started not as a data collection effort, but as an effort at centralizing research and policy across many different organizations. Uh, so to this end, we created a global hub that uh, centralizes the research being done across uh, high quality, rigorous uh, uh, research organizations, both in academia and in the policy advisory space. Uh, it was in response to this that we started to put together a plan for collecting our own data to supplement this and to produce as much as possible uh, nationally relevant data in a wide variety of countries. This has resulted in our uh, rapid response surveys in which we've worked with policymakers in nine different countries to uh, understand what are the most critical and the most actionable policy questions and then focus on them in our surveys uh, to a general population. Uh, so this has resulted in 
uh, this has resulted in a number of important engagements in which we've been able to work with uh, government ministries, in which we've been able to uh, work with researchers to ensure that their solutions are, are aimed at the right kinds of the right kinds of problems. Um, and then on top of that, we've uh, we've taken this as an opportunity to strengthen what we call research on research, in which we've come to uh, understand much better some of the potential and some of the drawbacks of uh, phone-based survey methods and random digit dialing in countries like Zambia. So the important takeaways, uh, there, there, we will be getting into the, uh, into the details and making sure that we, we cover each of these um, with more clarity later on, but I, I wanted to take some time to go through some of the major takeaways from this, uh, from this presentation. These are lessons that we learned using the, the first round of data collection um, in, in this project. So the first one I want to highlight is that um, the over 25% of respondents say they never stayed home in the past week. So when I say the past week, we'll get into when that was, but it was shortly after the, uh, the crisis started to take on an international, uh, an international scope and countries around the world were uh, setting up lockdown policies and the like. Um, so this is to say that, uh, that there was widespread compliance with social distancing measures, but by no means universal. Um, the next thing is that, uh, most people who had worked in the past week said that they were earning less than uh, they did before government schools closed, where school closure is what we used as an anchoring point to help respondents remember what was before and what was after uh, the onset of the COVID-19 crisis. Um, so this is on top of the, all of the people who uh, were not, no longer working at all. So there was a significant drop uh, from our survey in uh, labor force participation in general. And then of those who are working, there was uh, less money being earned. Um, the, importantly, this, this seems correlated with, a, uh, with responses around having to deplete savings uh, or take on risky debt. So as incomes have dropped and as, um, as some uh, health and uh, household crises have continued to come in, the, uh, the coping mechanisms that we see households taking are overwhelmingly around uh, divestment of productive assets and reduction in savings and taking on of debt. So this is to say that uh, even if the, the immediate crisis um, proves temporary, its ramifications are likely to be long term. The next thing is that uh, we, we we do see that this has implications for the household welfare overall. Uh, so 35% of respondents say they had to limit the size of meals or reduce the number of meals they were uh, taking. Um, and this was um, to, on some margin disproportionately true for, uh, for households with children. So this is to say that the, these reductions in economic activity and these reductions in savings uh, have had a, or did have a short term uh, impact on uh, household well-being. Finally, 50% uh, of respondents who have primary school age children um, say that they are, uh, are spending time on education at home. Um, uh, this is less for uh, students with secondary schooling uh, or secondary school age children. Um, so we'll get into the, the uh, details of how distance learning has been going and uh, what are the main concerns of parents and, uh, and caretakers uh, later on in this, in this presentation. Uh, before we do that, I, I want to be very clear as to who it is we are talking about and how we can understand the, the results of the survey. Um, so importantly, this, this survey started in mid-June and uh, proceeded for around three weeks. Um, it was a random digit dialing uh, sampling procedure, right? So this, this means that it was a nationally representative uh, sample of active phone numbers. 
this is useful because it helps us uh, get a very broad range of the uh, of the population in Zambia. So uh, other researchers and other projects that we've seen have been focusing on se survey samples that already existed, which is useful because you can understand a lot of about the background of these respondents and a lot about their context, uh, but it doesn't give you generalizable knowledge if, for example, you're only working with a group of farmers in a particular region, or if you're only look, working with uh, people in a particular sector in a particular city. So this had very, very broad coverage. But importantly, a random sample of phone numbers is not a random sample of people. Uh, so there were, um, there were a number of ways in which the uh, sample we're looking at probably differs from the, the national population. Um, in general, so uh, we had around 43% of respondents were women. Um, this is not too far off from the from the national average. I, I mean, it is it is far off, but we think that we have a significant uh, a significant representation of both men and women. Um, uh, the age of adult respondents um, was uh, was thirty two years old, and then uh, importantly, and these are the these are the things that that need to be noted most most clearly is that uh, there. As a rule, a random digit dialing sample is disproportionately um, wealthy, is disproportionately well-educated, and disproportionately urban. Uh, so there are ways for us to adjust for this. Um, so we, we have an 80% uh, secondary school completion rate, and uh, we, we have methods um, the, for re-weighting the sample to make this a little more representative. We've not presented the weighted results here because we want to be as transparent as possible about the, uh, the results in this particular sample, uh, but it's something to keep in mind. We have done a bit of, the, of this re-weighted um, re sampling work. Uh, we find, I mean, I, I would characterize the results as qualitatively similar. So, you, you don't see the exact same numbers if you reweight the sample. Um, but as you see, as you'll see, most of these questions, uh, you didn't see a, a, a significant difference between households with secondary school completion and those without. Um, you don't see a huge difference even between those who we estimate to be living under the poverty line and those without. Um, so we estimate that uh, around 31% of our sample is living under the national poverty line, uh, which is to say again that while it is not nationally representative, we do have a significant sample um, in both categories uh, to do disaggregated analysis. All right, so uh, I won't I won't go through in the interest of time. I won't go through this entire uh, timeline, uh, but it is worth looking at. So just to give you a sense of when we started uh, our survey and how it relates to the lockdowns and partial um, and partial school closures and these other uh, policies. So what you can see is that uh, the uh, the major policies uh, that were were aimed at mitigating the effects of COVID-19 in Zambia uh, started in March and went through to mid-May. Uh, that those were the the primary dates in which you had you had this kind of uh, this kind of suspension of travel, um, closing borders, uh, mandates for face masks, and uh, business closure. Our survey was after this, um, so this this is important for interpretation because in in some places where we were doing surveys right as lockdowns were starting, you might expect that uh, changes in welfare. Um, relative to February were a temporary blip as people just were staying home for a few weeks and then everything goes back to normal. Um, I think that would be the wrong interpretation in this case just because we were uh, able to allow the policy context to play out somewhat and then came back and said, okay, how are you doing right now? So. And now I will hand it over to, uh, to my colleague. Uh, thank you, Elliot. Um, this is Salifu. Um, I will start with uh, section one of four. Um, the first one, we have health and COVID mitigation. And jumping right into it, um, into the results, um, the 
in terms of perception of risk, um, less than half of our respondents say they feel someone in their household is at risk of contracting the COVID virus. And for those who do not feel at risk of contracting the virus, um, over 90% of them say that is because they are following the COVID-19 preventive measures. You can see that shown on the right side of your screen. Very few think um, the virus does not exist, which is um, positive for us. Next slide. Then when we ask respondents if they were practicing COVID-19 preventive measures or behaviors, we find positive and, and not so positive responses. Um, with most of them, it's almost 80% report to have washed their hands more frequently than before the onset of the pandemic. And about the same proportion as the 80% reporting wearing at least a home made face mask in public um, for at least once in the past seven days. But we find not so positive results when it comes to staying at home, um, with more than a quarter saying they did not stay at home entirely for even one day in the past seven days. We find that men are more likely than women to not stay at home entirely the past seven days, whilst women were more likely than men to stay at home every day of the last seven days. We find similar trends between poor and non-poor respondents. Then on social protection and financial res resilience, um, respondents reported experiencing adverse effects due to COVID related restrictions. And there were reports of shortages of food, um, drops in income, increases in food prices and reduction in portion sizes. Um, from the data we have, less than half experienced shortages of food or reduction in portion sizes, and more than half experienced drops in income or high prices of food, which prevented them from um, buying food. When we compare households with school age children um, to those without in terms of the ability to buy food, we find that most of those with um, school age children are more likely than those without to report difficulty in buying the usual amount of food um, because of high prices of food or drops in household income. Next. And we also find that uh, more than half of our respondents say they have had to deplete their savings to pay for food, um, health care, or other expenses since February. Then in terms of access to emergency funds, 20% um, said they could not come up with 800 kwacha within the next 30 days if they had an emergency. Um, this, is, this, this is more common among respondents in the Luapula province. And for those who could come up with the 800 kwacha within 30 days, most re respondents from Northern province um, had the least difficulty, while those in Eastern province had the most, most difficulty in doing so. And we move on to the policy implications. Uh, Dr. Andrews will take over from me. Well, thank you very much, um, Salif, for, for that overview. Um, and I just want to, to go ahead and give a, a perspective from the um, 
Zambia and Ministry of Health. Um, first of all, I wish to acknowledge the fact that Zambia has been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, like many other African countries. Um, and we recognize that the pandemic is really rapidly evolving. Um, with far-reaching repercussions on people, on livelihoods, on, on economies. And um, the need for robust evidence to inform policy and to inform decision-making um, is very, very critical uh, because we need to have this evidence to help us respond appropriately and effectively um, as we mount the response to mitigate the impact of the COVID-19 um, on, on, on the population. Um, and in this regard, I'm quite uh, delighted with the work that um, IPA has been doing uh, in Zambia in providing government with um, the advice on evidence-based approaches um, as we respond to the COVID-19. Um, let me speak to some of the findings that um, have come out from this survey. Um, the survey sheds some light on issues that have implications on, on, on policy. And the first one I want to highlight is um, the fact that we, we see from the survey that risk perception among the population seems to be quite low. And this really does confirm our suspicions uh, that the, the, the level of perceiving, of people perceiving themselves as being at risk is quite low. And of course, that has implications on how people um, implement preventive measures as we respond to, to the pandemic. For the Ministry of Health, I think this underscores the need for us to enhance risk communication and community engagement as a major pillar in our response in order to ensure that the people are well informed and are able to take measures um, to protect themselves from contracting COVID-19. This, of course, will call for um, quite a, a huge shift in terms of resources targeted towards uh, risk communication and community engagement. We also note um, from the survey that 35% of those that participated say that they had to limit food portion sizes or reduce the number of meals that they had a week. Uh, this is quite concerning, of course, and, and particularly in households that have children because we know the negative uh, repercussions that this would have on the children. Um, in this regard, uh, one implication that um, this brings to the fore is um, the fact that in as much as we are taking measures to um, prevent the spread of COVID, it is important that we maintain the provision of essential services um, and essential activities that relate to the health of the people. Um, for instance, health promotion activities, while at the same time making every effort to reduce um, the risk. I have in mind, for instance, an activity that we routinely undertake, which is growth monitoring in children to be able to identify those children that are most at risk of falling into um, malnutrition so that we are able to pick them out early um, and um, put in interventions to, to improve their nutritional status. So um, with this revelation that um, quite a significant portion of the families are at risk of suffering from nutritional deficiencies. It is important that um, such monitoring activities such as growth monitoring should continue. Um, but as we do that, we ensure that we put in place measures uh, that um, reduce the risk of people contracting 
um, COVID-19. Let me go further to uh, just uh, highlight the fact that um, we think that from the finding of the survey, the need for enhanced multi-sectoral collaboration and coordination um, uh, has, has, has really been highlighted. Um, for instance, I think that the Ministry of Health should work more closely with the Ministry of Community Development and Social Services in order to enhance better targeting and linkage of vulnerable households and individuals to social protection programs, such as the social cash transfer that um, government is implementing, so that the people that are most at risk uh, can be linked to these services that would be able to, push, to cushion the, um, the, the risk that they face. Um, we also see the likelihood of increased healthcare expenditure among the people, which would lead to financial hardship for vulnerable households. In Zambia, we recently introduced the National Health Insurance Scheme, uh, which is intended to really broaden insurance, health insurance cover for our population. What has um, happened so far is that we have by and large been able to capture um, a huge proportion of those that are in the formal employment sector. But um, seeing that um, many households are at risk of um, financial hardships, I think this does um, underscore the need for us to create a mechanism for us to expedite the process of bringing the informal sector on board so that um, those that are in the informal sector are also covered uh, with um, the, the, the health insurance because these in fact may be even more at risk for catastrophic health expenditure compared to those that are in formal employment. Um, let me further highlight um, the, the issue um, that relates to being able to raise resources in emergency situations. Um, we saw clearly that quite um, a significant proportion of, of our, our population may not be able to raise um, resources in emergency situations. And what comes to my mind is an emergency such as a, a woman in a rural area uh, who needs to um, go and access um, health services um, in, 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 a, in a health facility, or indeed a woman who may be pregnant and, and needs to go to the hospital to, to go and deliver. Um, those emergency situations where the woman needs to be transported uh, really cause quite uh, serious difficulties in the current context we are talking about. And from the policy point of view, uh, I'm thinking that um, this should uh, help us look at uh, strengthening community referral systems, which uh, would be able to cushion uh, households and families in, in such uh, emergency situations. Finally, I would like to say that um, the survey to me brings to the fore uh, the equity lens. Uh, it really does uh, help to uh, shine the light on who is affected the most by the COVID-19 pandemic um, and where are they found. And um, that begins to make us think about what interventions can we put in place to try and mitigate the uh, difficulties and the hardships that um, they, are, they are facing. Um, thank you so much. I, I will end my remarks there. Thank you so much, Director, for those uh, uh, submissions. I will now turn over to the next presentation on education and economic activity. Over to you, Salito. Thank you, Tamara. Um, on economic activity and employment, um, you can move to the next slide. We find that more than half of respondents reporting working in February. And this proportion reduces to 44% reporting working in the last seven days.
Then of the 44% who reported working in the past seven days, more than half of them say they work fewer hours and earn less than they did before the school schools. Mutinga province had the most businesses or places of work opened and conducting their usual businesses among the other provinces in Zambia. Then on education, um, that's the last section. Um, about half of our respondents report that their primary school children um, are spending time on education at home, which is good. And over 30% of respondents report that the primary school children spend more than two hours per day on education during the pandemic. We see about 40% of secondary school children um, also spending more than two hours on average on education at home. And even though there are several avenues for um, distance learning, um, as you, you list at, at the bottom of the graph, a majority of children who engaged in distance learning um, did so using their own books. Next. And we find that lack of motivation, um, lack of support from teachers and schools, and lack of access to television uh, were cited as the main reasons why children are not spending uh, more time on education at home. Um, less than 25% of households with a child in primary school and less than 25% of households with a child uh, in secondary school have been, contact, have been contacted um, by anyone uh, from their children's school um, during the time the, period, the, the schools have closed. This means that um, there were very, very few, less than a quarter contacts made um, during the period of the pandemic. Thank you. I um, would now hand over to Besnat to comment on the education policy implications. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. My name is Besna Simchembu Kangalu, and I'm going to give a brief, brief uh, presentation on what the Ministry of General Education is doing in terms of providing education provision. Uh, in my brief presentation, I'll I'll, I'll highlight the Ministry of General Education's responses to the COVID-19. I'll also highlight what the ministry has learned through the recover survey and also what the Ministry of General Education intends to do with the information provided. So uh, just to mention that the Ministry of Education has put up a number of interventions to mitigate the impact of the school closure, especially for the examination classes. And uh, the school closure has resulted into loss of learning and teaching time, as well as the disruption of the academic calendar. And therefore, the Ministry of Education came up with some interventions that are being implemented as a means of taking the classroom to where the learners should be. The first intervention I'm going to talk about is uh, through e-learning. The Ministry of General Education has, in conjunction with um, Zamtel, a telecommunications company, launched two e-learning platforms, which is the national e-learning portal. And this one provides teaching and learning content for early childhood education, primary, secondary, youth and adult literacy education. The second platform is uh, the smart revision portal. This portal provides revision content for examination classes. That is the grade sevens, grade nines and grade twelves. And uh, this platform does contain past papers, possible solutions, thereby providing feedback to our learners. Another intervention that we are 
implementing is through the television and uh, the Ministry of General Education launched the education television channel. This channel is accessible on various broadcasters that include the national broadcaster and other private service providers, which include uh, Mount Choice, Topstar, and uh, GoTV. Uh, with this intervention, what we have learned is that several teachers and sign language interpreters have been engaged in the production of the television lessons and have signed in a bid to assist those with hearing impairment. So uh, the learners with special education needs are being taken care of. And uh, with this intervention, we also have quality assurance teams that have been set up to ensure that the edited programs are being evaluated before they are aired. To continue on the interventions, we also uh, implement teaching and learning through the radio. And the Ministry of General Education runs the Education Broadcasting Radio, whose transmission covers Lusaka, which is the capital city of Zambia, and the surrounding areas. Using this intervention, we have so far over 1,000 radio programs that have so far been recorded, and we have over 500 lessons that have been edited with uh, assistance from our cooperating partners. With these interventions, uh, lessons are being aired on different community radio stations across the country. The fourth intervention is the self-instructional learning materials, where the ministry has partnered with the Zambia College of Distance Education, and uh, these materials are intended to assist the learners in the hard to reach areas, where other alternative modes of education, such as the radio, the television and the e-learning may be a challenge. And in collaboration with our stakeholders, the ministry has printed self-study modules that are currently being distributed to regions that recorded the poorest results in the past year, 2019. And this is in an effort to help the learners catch up. So what has uh, the Ministry of General Education learned through the Recover Survey? Many thanks to IPA, though premature to conclude, as a ministry, we have learned that uh, very few learners are using TV, radio, and internet for learning. As a ministry, we have also learned that um, the learners are not spending as much time on the TV as they should, despite the channels being aired 24 hours a day. Again, through the Recover Survey, we have also learned that our teachers are not reaching out to their households in this period of the closure. Therefore, we realize that our learners are falling behind in their education this year. So what does the Ministry of Education hope to do with the information provided through the Recover Survey? Uh, we intend to increase sensitization and advertising on the platforms because we realize from the results that uh, this will enable us to reach out to all the parents and the learners. We also intend to, we also see the need to sensitize the teachers and the learners on the use of the portal. The information also indicates that uh, we need to improve the delivery of lessons on the TV on the radio and internet. For instance, we intend to create groups of teachers that will attend to the learners' queries timely so that our learners are not discouraged. We're also looking out for strategies on how we can engage our teachers from the public schools to be able to give live lessons and interact with the learners during the live sessions on the platforms. The Recover also the Recover has also uh, given us an indication that we need to widen our radio outreach by providing the engagement with community radio stations to air the lessons to the learners that that are being produced at all levels from early childhood and to great to grade 12. Therefore, many thanks to IPA 
for this collaboration and for partnering with us. And we look forward to continue collaborating with our partners. We also look forward to continue lobbying and mobilizing funds to implement the interventions highlighted in an effort to bring the classroom closer to our learners. As I end my brief presentation, I just want to make mention that as a ministry, we are excited. As a ministry, we are excited that uh, in today's address, the president of Zambia, His Excellency Edgar Chagwalungu, did announce that uh, the schools will reopen between 14th and 28th September. So as a ministry and we, together with our cooperating partners, we're excited that we are going to tighten our efforts in, in, in achieving uh, quality education, providing quality education to all our learners. So many thanks to IPF for providing these results for these findings. And with these findings, we ask that we continue to work together so that we may deliver the quality education to our learners. I thank you. Thank you, Besnet, for uh, the presentation. I think we've heard quite a lot about um, um, how households are coping with the COVID-19 and also the policy responses from Minister of General Education and Minister of Health. At this point, I'll turn over the mic to um, uh, witness to make a presentation on COVID-19 in Malawi. Nora, thank you very much uh, um, for this opportunity. I'll be um, giving you kind of a snapshot of or, um, how Malawi as a country we fared um, were, um, on the COVID-19. Okay, so uh, as, as introduced, I'm witness Afonso from the Institute of Public Opinion and Research in Malawi, which is a, uh, a research firm we are involved in a lot of social science uh, studies in Malawi. So I'll, I'll be talking about uh, social economic impacts of COVID blamed in the, they are very fundamental, especially for the uh, our policy makers. Um, yeah, so you might wish to know that it, I think Malawi was one of the countries that it, um, was the last countries to experience, I mean, to, um, to have the cases of COVID-19 confirmed. I think it, we first had our, um, our first case of COVID-19 uh, on a May, I mean, April 2, 2020. But even before that, uh, the government trying to take care uh, decided to uh, establish a special cabinet, cabinet committee on COVID-19 to make sure that it, it helps in terms of trying to come up with um, ways on how they can manage or prevent the spread of COVID-19 in Malawi. And the, that followed um, another effort by government where the president declared a state of national disaster on May 20, and among other things, in, um, <clears throat> included the closure of all the schools from primary school, secondary school, and even the universities. They also decided to close the borders and the, um, as well as putting some restrictions on public gatherings, uh, uh, I mean, telling people not to, to, to be in a groups to ensure that the, the spread of the virus, uh, I mean, of the of coronavirus is contained. But as I mentioned that lastly, on the 2nd April, Malawi uh, had three cases. The first cases conf were confirmed um, on a 
uh, second April 2020, this was in Ilirongwe, and the government now decided to put extra measures, and that included um, trying to uh, uh, implement a national lockdown to ensure that people are not moving around uh, in order to contain, uh, I mean, the situation. But it, uh, it was interesting to note that the Malawians were against that decision, and the, um, some, I mean, some CSOs uh, went to court, and this lockdown initiative was challenged, and it was never uh, implemented. And the, uh, you might wish to know that I think that was also the time it was a critical time politically because that was the time that we were also going towards the um, fresh presidential elections, and the, we managed to have the fresh presidential elections uh, on the 23 June, and the, that um, ended in a change of government where the opposition won the uh, election, I mean, in oppressing the then DPP government. But there have also been even efforts by the new government to make sure that um, the COVID-19 uh, situation is uh, contained. This includes like the um, initiative by government to gazette uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, prevention measures on the 7th August. But as of 10th uh, September, Malawi had about 5,655 cases. And uh, of all those cases, um, only 1,786 are active or were active. And the uh, COVID-19 has managed, uh, I mean, has managed to kill about 176 people. But the 3,683 have recovered. OK, so. I just wanted to share with you a snapshot of, of the cases so far. You see, I mean, from this uh, graph, you can see that I think he, uh, currently we are going towards, I mean, the numbers have been uh, decreasing a lot to the extent that, it, I, like yesterday, I think we only uh, had two cases uh, confirmed. So this simply shows that it, at the moment, the number of cases have really reduced, and it, it seems their efforts have helped to contain, um, I mean, the spread of the pandemic. So I'll be presenting uh, this part of the uh, results from a study that we conducted um, between May and June. This was the first, first study, but it followed another study that we conducted in, in May and June, which was like a first COVID study to be con a, social, a social science study to be conducted on COVID. So this study was a first to face study and the sample size was 1,346. Um, this was the study that I co-conducted uh, with the help from the OSISA. Um, so I just want to give you some of the findings uh, of, of, of the study. It was interesting to know that at that time, almost everybody had, had heard about, about COVID-19 in Malawi. You can see that almost 99.9% .9 after asking them if they have heard about COVID-19, they said they have heard about COVID-19. And the seven out of 10 people thought that it, COVID-19 is a serious problem with only two out of 10 and, um, and alerting it. But what is very uh, interesting to, to see was that it, how were Malawians pursuing, uh, perceiving the severity of the problem? You see that most Malawians thought that yes, COVID-19 is a serious uh, thing, but it, still uh, most people would survive while well some would die. This simply shows that not a lot of Malawians had that serious a thought, or we are not really um, afraid of COVID-19. Um, however, you also see that most Malawians express that, they, oh yeah, they think that COVID-19 is a serious problem in the country at 83 percent, with the two thirds of majority uh, saying that they were afraid of getting uh, a coronavirus. And the, comparing men and women, you, the results showed that mostly men and the, those living in the uh, rural areas are where the ones uh, that were mostly afraid of uh, COVID-19. So um, about two thirds of the citizens also felt that uh, there is a high probability of them uh, getting infected with the COVID-19 even in the, th uh, in the near future. As the, that graph can show, you see that the uh, males, uh, uh, men in Malawi at 66%, compared to women where the ones who are afraid of getting COVID-19 and looking at the, uh, I mean, um, 
uh, based on the locality, you see that the rural people compared to the urban people were also the ones who were afraid of getting COVID-19. But this makes sense simply because 80% of the population of Malawi is in the rural area. And if, even if you see uh, on issues to do with access to health services, the rural is uh, really uh, deprived in terms of, of uh, access to health services. Now, we also wanted to find out um, if, uh, uh, if uh, Malawians are afraid of dying from COVID-19. And uh, I mean, corresponding to the previous uh, findings, you see that the men actually were also afraid of, uh, I mean, expressed that, uh, expressed that they were seriously afraid of dying from COVID-19, uh, just like those in the rural areas, as well as those living in the southern region of Malawi. What were the attitudes towards COVID-19? So asking them if, we, if they were free of, or if they were willing to go for COVID-19 testing, I mean, the majority of Malawians experienced, uh, I mean, expressed willingness to go for um, COVID-19 testing if they had shown or if they experienced some signs and symptoms of uh, COVID-19 or indeed if they have been exposed to anyone uh, whom they suspect to have uh, COVID-19. And the two thirds of Malawians said, oh yes, we are ready to wear face masks to make sure that we are, uh, we are safe from COVID-19. And in addition to that majority of Malawians were also ready to practice hand washing and sanitizing to make sure that they are safe from uh, COVID-19. And they, we, uh, about three quarters of Malawians also said, no, oh, no, they are ready to practice social distance. Just showing that they had that initiative to make sure that they, on their own, they also keep themselves safe from COVID-19. But we also wanted to find out what were some of the economic impacts of COVID-19 at both the household as well as at the uh, country, at the national level. So majority of Malawians at 80% said that their households were seriously hit by COVID-19. And the about half of Malawians uh, uh, lamented of serious economic impacts of um, COVID-19, saying that they really they were experiencing uh, economic uh, impact, uh, the negative economic impact as uh, uh, coming out from the COVID-19 um, uh, in Malawi. And the, if we try to compare the urban dwellers and the, uh, uh, and the rural dwellers, the survey findings showed that the urban dwellers uh, exp uh, experienced serious economic problems compared to those living in the rural areas. And we're trying also to see how the impacts are affecting people of different levels of education. The findings of the study showed that the people with the higher levels of education experienced more ch economic challenges compared to those with less education. Uh, I think if you can see from that graph, I think it, it explains um, uh, the uh, findings that I've just um, uh, presented. But even away from the, uh, from the household level, going to the national level, asking them if they feel that COVID-19 has impacted on the economy of the country. 87% um, of Malawians said that they were worried that the really COVID-19 pandemic has negatively affected the economy of, of the country. I would say about six out of 10 are also uh, expressing that they were seriously worried that the COVID-19 pandemic, pandemic has left Malawi's economy in tatters. Unfortunately, we also asked them if they were confident that the government, uh, the current, uh, the then government was doing well in, try, in trying to manage, uh, to manage the COVID-19 situation. And the uh, plurality of Malawians experienced that, uh, I mean, expressed that they had no confidence or they were not convinced on the way the then government, which was led by the uh, Democratic Progressive Party, the way it was, I mean, it was managing the COVID-19 situation. So you'd see that with that graph, almost 87% were saying that no, no, they were really worried about uh, the way the COVID-19 has affected the, uh, the economy of the country. Now, we just wanted to briefly um, see how are these results um, showing or trying to inform uh, on issues to do with the policy. You see that we, uh, from the results, we think that the Malawi, the perception of Malawians on the severity of the COVID-19 matters uh, in, I mean, when you're trying to look at how government or institutions are trying to enforce regulations that are aimed at um, curbing the COVID-19 uh, pandemic spread. You see that uh, 
most Malawians thought that yes, COVID-19 is a serious problem, but it, a lot of people would still survive and only a few would die. So the way they would react or respond to some of the measures that were put across by government to ensure that they contain the pandemic, they were challenged by some of the perceptions. So people think that, oh no, yeah, it's COVID-19. Uh, a lot of people they are going to survive and just a few will die. So yeah, I get, they can disregard some of the measures that we have put, uh, that have been put uh, by, uh, by um, um, different institutions in the country trying to, I mean, to cut the spread of the, of the, of the, vi um, of the virus. And the, one thing we're also getting from, from the study findings is that they have, they have been that interest uh, from the public to go for COVID-19 testing. You might wish to know that I think from the background that in Malawi, not everybody was allowed to go for testing. There were just people that were suspected to have been uh, in contact uh, with the, anybody or they are suspected to, to have coronavirus. They are the ones that government were prioritizing to, uh, to be tested, but it, it was not open for anybody to go for testing. But you'd see that Malawians were expressing interest um, to go for testing. This, this is a good feedback to government to say that if, it had the capacity to, to roll out mass, a mass testing. This was possible because already there was that interest from, from the general public. And one thing that we're also getting from the, from the results of the study is issues to do with the um, use of trusted institutions in terms of messaging or implementation of interventions aimed at trying to limit the, uh, to limit the spread of the virus. From, uh, from this study and from uh, other studies that have been conducted so far, like the uh, GLOD uh, COVID-19 study, it has been revealed that Malawians think that the best uh, institutions to be used in terms of messaging and the implementation of uh, COVID-19 uh, management interventions would be the local uh, traditional leaders as well as the healthy personnel. So these are coming out highly as the most trusted institutions that can be used in a, when you are trying to put across uh, measures or implement interventions aimed at uh, trying to uh, prevent or manage COVID-19 spread in the country. One other um, thing we are also getting from, from the results of this study is the uh, issues to do, on, um, to do with the um, thinking of measures when you're trying to uh, implement, uh, um, I mean measures to do with the COVID, to, uh, to uh, curb the spread of new COVID-19, government or institutions also need to uh, look at survival measures. You know, the way local down, uh, lockdown initiative was, uh, I mean, challenged in Malawi, it simply shows that it, before government was, up, was coming up with that um, measure to, uh, I mean, to implement a lockdown, they were supposed to look at survival measures of the population. Because most, of, most people uh, went into the streets challenging that decision simply because they said it was, uh, I mean, it was uh, um, affecting only their ways uh, that they survive in, in terms of how they get money their economic ways um, of getting money. So they challenged that, that initiative simply because they thought putting them under lockdown is the same as killing them because they will not have access to food. They will not uh, have uh, ways to make money and that will affect their lives. No wonder they challenged it. So basically we are getting the feedback to say before you implement some measures aiming at it, coming uh, uh, the spread of COVID-19, COVID it's also very important to have a serious reflection on the survival measures of the population and perhaps getting in feed, I mean, evidence from some of the uh, studies that have been conducted looking at how Malawians survive in order to bring in um, uh, only measures that also take, uh, I mean, take care or understand uh, how Malawians survive and the link on how they can, in, they can bring in issues that will be recept, uh, I mean, accepted and received highly by, by the population. So yes, we want to prevent them from, from the pandemic, but also don't want to kill them with the hunger. So this is also one very important, uh, I mean, feedback that we are getting from, from, uh, from the uh, finding of this study. And lastly, we are also getting uh, feedback on the importance of government legitimacy. You see that from the results of the study, Malawians felt that the government was not doing enough to, uh, I mean, to, uh, to limit the spread of COVID-19. No wonder most of the, uh, I mean, actions or activities that were rolled out were challenged by, by, by the population simply because 
the government had no mandate, had no legitimacy on its, I mean, on its citizens. So it, it, it simply shows that when the government has got legitimacy, citizens are going to respect the decisions that government make. I will just uh, give you like a, a brief a comparison on some of the decisions that um, the previous government uh, made and the, uh, some of the decisions that the current government has made. For example, uh, the issues of, uh, I mean, gazetting the, uh, I mean, the, um, the prevention measures. We are sure that the very same measures were also, I mean, expressed by the previous government that they were challenged. But this time, with the current government, which we think most Malawians are, uh, uh, I mean, uh, they, they are respecting, to use that word, they have still managed to understand and accept the gazetting of those measures. And the, a lot of people are also able uh, to follow those measures. So this simply shows that it, government legitimacy is very fundamental in terms of um, coming up with interventions aimed at um, limiting the spread of um, pandemics like COVID-19. Uh, briefly, this is uh, some of the things that I wanted to share from, from this side. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, witness, for that presentation. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. Um, there's still a lot more to discuss. We've taken note of the questions that have come through the question and answer platform, and we will share a report after this um, uh, on the questions that we didn't get a chance to answer. Uh, we know that you are all coming from a very different backgrounds. So if you're interested in partnering with us or learning more, please reach out at uh, contact at povertyaction.org. Thank you so much again for, for joining the webinar today. And for more about the Recover Initiative, please visit our website. You'll be able to find more information and data about uh, Recover in the uh, different countries that we've worked in. Thank you so much again for your time.